So we're looking at cosmogenic nuclide co uh, applications, and um, I sh I'm just going to put a little advertisement out that there is a new Elements volume out just this year. So this is for, um, or just this month, actually, just in October. And um, if you email me or copy this website down, you can download the whole packet of, of uh, articles, apparently, because it's for education, that's fine for me to do. Um, and in there, there's an intro by uh, Friedhelm von Blankenberg and I, who was the co-editor of the volume. Also, some um, a paper on the nuts and bolts of nuclide production, some work on glacial systems, active tectonics, which might be interesting to a lot of you. And then um, two articles that I'm going to talk about, um, which are how to erode a landscape and then also making soil. And um, I just wanted to say that I am going to be talking mostly about this in situ variety of beryllium 10. So Greg mentioned a whole bunch of different nuclides that you can use. And so I'm kind of just going to be talking about um, mostly beryllium-10, because it is the most widely used. There's um, the vast majority of, I guess, vast majority of uh, measured uh, cosmogenic nuclide dates or even rates are using beryllium-10. And um, there's this whole other production pathway in meteoric beryllium-10, sort of like uh, carbon-14, uh, conventional carbon-14 that we've been talking about in the last talk. Um, but we're limiting to in situ for, for the purposes today. And um, so um, I don't want to go over this too much more, but um, so some of the principles of cosmogenic dating can really be uh, summed up, I think, in this one figure. So in one case, you have the concentration of your cosmogenic nuclide, and if you're uh, over a short enough period of time where you don't get the impacts of um, decay or loss of the nuclide over time, then this is what happens to your concentration over time. And so you can think of this as uh, this N as mapping to a specific exposure age. Um, and this is the accumulation of those, those nuclides. Now, if you had a burial age, here's your concentration N. You have some starting concentration to begin with. And then over time, you lose that nuclide. Um, if you have uh, coupled nuclides with different uh, decay rates or half-lives, you can use the concentration of both of those. And then you get some uh, extra information. So instead of just having you know, that really under-constrained problem like Greg was talking about where you have a range of erosion rates and a range of ages, you can sometimes pick out cases where you can use two nuclides and then you have two um, pieces of information and two unknowns and then you can actually um, solve this, uh, what seemed like an under-constrained problem. So you can also, um, look at denudation rates. So this is uh, time on this axis again, and this is concentration on this axis. And in the case where you have fast erosion, then you can build up to a sort of steady concentration. And this is if you have slow erosion. So imagine you have a surface eroding very slowly. You're able to build up more of that let's say beryllium 10, than if you had a fast erosion rate where you're constantly removing the surface of your, your, um, your material. Um, I won't talk about this one today, but um, we can also think about how we might determine sedimentation rate. So in this case, we have uh, the natural log of the concentration, and this should increase with core depth. Um, and this one we'll talk about too, fault slip rate, where we get um, these periods of episodic accumulation. Um, and so this is uh, low height above the fault base, and this is high height above the fault base. So I'll give uh, three examples of how these, are, these different things are used. So I won't be talking about the glacial case, because Greg talked about that quite a bit. Um, 
but I'll just talk about these three, so active tectonics, eroding the landscape, and making of soils. And, um, and I also removed the San Andreas case because Greg already talked about it. But, um, but one of the nice things about, that's no, okay. <laughs> I was glad I can talk about something else. Um, but one of the reasons that cosmogenic nuclides are particularly nice for earth scope applications, for example, are because they uh, are nestled nicely between measurements of geodesy and between measurements um, where we can uh, over long time scales measure something about the geology or other kinds of dating methods that are over these long time scales. And so um, we can actually look at the, the surface of the earth, figure out what kinds of things are datable that are getting at this uh, active tectonics aspect. So uh, he mentioned that we can actually look at the offset of alluvial fans. This is one example of that. And we can also look at fault scarps and how this uh, downthrown block is exposing that, um, that fault scarp right at the bottom there. And so this is one of the cases where you can actually do this. Um, here's the Magnolia uh, fault scarp in the, the Apennines. And so they sampled along the scarp. This is actually one of those perfect cases where you have uh, a material like uh, carbonate where you ha have uh, production of C uh, chlorine 36. And you can actually um, date all along this scarp. And so this is kind of just a schematic. This is a model of how it might look. And so if they uh, measure ages along this fault scarp, they can get a cumulative slip over this whole time range. And so for this, um, they've measured that they had uh, five uh, earthquakes over the last um, 8,000 years for this particular fault scarp. And this is an important um, site because we can actually um, use this method here because we have um, carbonate in a dry place. And so there's probably very little erosion. And so we can minimize that one part of this under constrained um, system. So um, moving on to eroding landscapes. So that's the, the active tectonics application. There could be others out there. Um, I'll talk about one in the last, the very last slide that's sort of maybe promising. Um, so one way that we can measure what's going on in terms of surface uplift and change of continents is by actually looking at how the Earth's surface changes over time. And when we think about the Earth's surface changing over time, we have things like uplift, we have things like subsidence, we have you know, dynamic topography changing things all the time, but then we also have mountain building and things like that. But if we're looking at the surface expression uh, on the surface of the Earth, what we're interested in is not just um, those forces that are pushing things up from below or pulling things down from below, but it's actually a sum of both being pushed up and also eroding of that surface. And so um, in some ways, we're interested in how landscapes erode, not just because of, um, as a way of reconciling um, what kind of morphologies we're seeing at the surface, but actually we could even start to think about how we might glean some information about the uh, uplift processes that are going on just from doing the inverse problem of looking at how much erosion is going on and inferring some kind of uplift from that. Um, so the typical way, though, that people measure this is that they assume that there's um, a if they have a high concentration of cosmogenic beryllium-10, let's say, then they have a slow erosion rate. And um, similarly, low concentrations, a fast erosion rate. And um, if you have a steady state where you have um, every cosmogenic nuclide that's produced in the system eventually makes it out through export in the landscape, through erosion of the material, then we can actually uh, calculate an erosion rate just from a handful of uh, sediments at the river mouth for that entire basin. And um, the idea behind this is that at steady state, you don't have uh, 
any kind of time dependent rates. So we've gone long enough in this, in this curve, like I was showing before, where we <coughs> no longer have any kind of time dependent behavior. And as the particle trajectory moves up through the landscape, um, it's giving you the erosion rate of that specific place. And that erosion, uh, or that sample, is being sampled at a rate that's uh, proportional to the erosion rate of the site. And so when you're getting your sampling location down here, you're sort of letting nature average for you, and you're getting all kinds of um, material from over here, and you're getting material from over here. But basically what it's giving you is the time that it's taking this particle to travel through that two meter uh, production zone where you're getting cosmogenic nuclides produced in the surface material. So if it's going through that fast, you don't have many beryllium-10 atoms. If it's going through it slow, then you have a lot. So in a steady state landscape, everything is fine. It works out very well. There have been uh, you know, studies where they know how much material has been removed and can figure out exactly what erosion rate you should get. And they, in fact, they match up. Um, but in transient landscapes, the kind that you might measure, if you're interested in looking at what sort of uh, impact on the landscape a pulse of uplift might have, for example, um, it's not so easy to do. And part of the reason for this is that whenever you raise part of the landscape, you don't get an instantaneous change in your geomorphic signal. And so when you have some impulse of uplift, this is your forcing function, let's say, Here's your impulse of uplift. Maybe it goes up and then back down, or maybe you have sustained uplift for some period of time. Then you have uh, a landscape that is re adjusting to that over time. And so you'll have um, a sample, if you collect it here, it's averaging something that's adjusting to this impulse of uplift, but then also something that's relict from a time before the um, the uplift even happened. And so you're getting this mixture between the two. And so you can imagine that if you had uh, this impulse of uplift, if you looked at your basin-wide erosion rate compared to the amount of relict area that you had, that you would actually get these different patterns depending on how your pulse of uplift actually occurred. So in one case, you might go, uh, your erosion rates might go back down once you had no more or uh, no more relict area compared to this sustained uplift case where the, the erosion rates just keep going up and up and up and up. So we, we thought about this in terms of looking at an actual place where we might get an impulse of uplift and um, tried it in the uh, South Fork Eel River, um, which is right here. And um, interestingly, the South Fork Eel River is in a geologically interesting area because it's at this Mendocino Triple Junction. And the Triple Junction has been, um, that we know through sedimentological studies, the, a nice paper by Locke, um, slide by Harvey Kelsey, looking at how this Mendocino Triple Junction has likely migrated, sending this pulse of uplift up along the California coast to nearly what is present day uh, Eureka if you know Northern California. And so interestingly, the South Fork Eel River runs parallel to this um, trajectory for the Mendocino Triple Junction migration. And so if we look at this, um, here's the watershed outlet. It's going out to the Pacific over here, downstream a bit. Here's the um, upper part of the basin. And here's the long profile of that river uh, in black here. And we know that there are that the wave of uplift from this situation has not really moved all the way through the landscape because we can see evidence of relict portions of the landscape, lands parts of the landscape where we haven't had complete adjustment. And so some of these, um, this evidence of incomplete adjustment to this new uplift scenario are through nick points or, or small waterfalls in the, the landscape. So every red point is a waterfall and, um, and we can also look at um, terrace fra fragments 
of a previous river profile demarcated by this uh, gray dashed line, where we know that the river was once at that higher level and now has incised. And so at this level up here, we know that this wave of incision has made it up to here. There's a big gorge there, but it hasn't actually made it above that. So above that is actually relic topography. And um, this is really interesting to me because this is actually, it's receiving meters of rain every year. The bedrock is really easy to pull apart. It's this melange. Um, it weathers quickly. It erodes quickly. And so even millions of years after the passage of the Mendocino Triple Junction uplift, we still have this geomorphic surface that has not really responded to this um, wave of uplift that's moved through the system. So if we can map this, um, this adjusted portion compared to the relict portion uh, demarcated by everything basically upstream of any nick point is, is relict. Um, and we can, we can make some cosmogenic nuclide measurements. So what, what is the wave of erosion that passes through this system um, based on how um, the wave of incision has passed through? And so if we look at these dots, these are basin-wide erosion rates, what we see is that we actually get an increase in the erosion rate as we go downstream. So um, what we wanted to do is figure out if this was predictable by um, a landscape evolution model. And so we used Child, Nicole Gasparini uh, was a collaborator on this. And so what we did is um, looked at a similar uh, topographic um, situation. It's not exactly the, the eel, but we can get some information from it and figure out if there's something that we can learn from what's going on in terms of our cosmogenic nuclide um, uh, data. So um, I'm going to play a movie. And in this movie, there's a lot going on. But uh, what you'll see is that rock uplift rate, you'll see that there's a wave of rock uplift. And then you'll see the incision rate. And the incision will have a small nick point here. And then it'll whip back as it hits the outside um, edge of the model. And then over here, we'll see what the basin-wide erosion rates are doing and what the river profile is doing as that wave of uplift moves through. Um, and we'll also look at how, um, how the uplift wave is moving through and how proportion of relict area is actually changing as well. So there's a lot going on to watch. So see how the erosion rates increase downstream. And then once we get to higher proportion uh, or lower proportion of relict, almost everything's adjusted. The erosion rates go back to normal. So this is sort of um, uh, telling for us. It tells us that this is um, corroborated by um, sort of intuition that we get from a model. And I'm going to skip through these, because these are just for in case there was no movie that worked, <laughs> which happens a lot, actually. <laughs> and um, so one of the things that we can do is map on here uh, where we have our stars, and we can figure out what proportion of, those, uh, of this landscape is relict. And then we, if we plot that on top of um, our model results, we see that we can actually get a pretty good um, correspondence between how our proportion of relict area that we know from mapping and our cosmogenic nuclide measurements match up to what we would expect from a model situation that's sort of tuned to be similar in terms of the uplift rates. So some of the take home messages from this one, this part of the talk, is um, that the time to full adjustment can actually be millions of years. And what, we, uh, what our dream might be is that we can actually look at past uplift from a current pattern of erosion and that we can back calculate how uplift has changed um, over time. So <clears throat> the other issue that we can do, uh, or other thing that we can do, is that throughout this um, catchment, there's a whole bunch of terraces. And um, if we look at the terraces, see that there's actually a strath on top, or a strath um, surface, bedrock um, cut by a river. 
And then there's fill of the river on top of that. And so because we were interested in the past erosion rates, um, we needed to know that the age of this terrace before we could figure out uh, erosion rates because we can't figure out both age and erosion rates in this situation. So um, there was no charcoal, which was our first go-to. We searched and searched. Lots of poison oak, though. And so we, um, we uh, did OSL sampling. And this is what it looked like, totally dark. <laughs> And um, it actually looked like that all the way back to the car, too, because we all forgot our headlamps, our multiple headlamps. It was like a, a black swan event or something like that. <laughs> so we collected our samples in the dark. And uh, what we did then is we could get the ages of these various terraces. And so here's just a schematic of a strath with a, some kind of alluvial cover on top of it. And so we're dating this alluvial cover. And then we're getting the paleo erosion rate when that, uh, when that fill was being uh, emplaced. And so what we find is that when we uh, measure all of these different terraces at different levels and plot them against the age, is that we find that we have a change in erosion rate over this sort of late um, Pleistocene, early Holocene transition. Um, even though we still have the same strath surface being, being carved. So this can um, either point to a change in how erosion was happening over this time, or it could point to how erosion was happening over this time. Okay. So um, people do this kind of work, looking at uh, paleo erosion rates all the time. And um, you can even look at, you can even use two nuclides to look at burial age um, of this specific surface if you have a deep enough terrace. Here's one in the Tian Shan, a picture, and that is pointing to a little town that's on top of one of these big terraces. And um, now there are a lot, actually, of paleo erosion rates, uh, in my mind, there pretty involved to do. And so if we think about um, what these paleo erosion rates are telling us, that most of these paleo erosion rates were done in order to figure out how uh, we've had some kind of change in climate that induced a change in the erosion rate um, from these times. So some of these go back to 9 million years ago. Um, and then the argument is that, oh, let's look at how the erosion changed when we switched from you know, the pre-quaternary um, time scale to the post-quaternary time scale. And so that's fine. Um, sometimes they increase, sometimes they decrease. But I think what we need to do is sort of think about how maybe some of these landscapes are not necessarily in a steady state with their uplift. Um, and that they're actually still in a, a position of transience. And so one of the reasons that people are really interested in looking at this effect of, of climate over long periods of time is this link with the carbon cycle. And um, I'll just quickly mention that um, this is one of the reasons that um, cosmogenic nuclides have sort of seen a real popularity in the last few years, is looking at the effect of how this CO2 uptake by silicate rock weathering can actually be measured um, today and maybe even in the past. And so this brings us to making soil. Here we have all kinds of different soils. Here's a soil over the top of a saprolite. Um, and it covers all kinds of landscapes. And here's uh, different ways that we can actually measure making soil. And one of the ways is that we can actually just look at how fast the soil is being produced. So we make some assumptions about um, the upward trajectory of a material as it moves through this production zone. Um, if this is fast, then we have fast rates of soil production. Um, if it's slow, uh, if we have lots of beryllium-10 by the time it reaches the surface, it's a slow rate of production, soil production. And so we can actually start to uh, test some of these models, and this is one of the, the classic papers of that, test some of these models of how soil production actually occurs, whether we can predict where it happens on the landscape and how fast. 
And whether, as Gilbert uh, hypothesized, whether it's a self-arresting feedback, where the more soil you have, the less your soil production rate, which is what this uh, slide or this figure is getting at. And so all, all over the world, people have been measuring these different soil production functions. And some of them certainly have this evidence of a self-arresting sort of feedback, where the bigger your soil thickness, the lower your soil production rate. And, um, and so some of them, though, no, show no clear sign of soil production with, um, with figuring out how um, soil thickness scales um, in, the, in all these different places. And so the other thing that people use cosmogenic nuclides for in, this, in making soil is to figure out uh, these various parts of this soil forming process. So um, we have uh, total denudation, which I should say is D, which is the total loss of mass above a soil particle. And so we have, uh, as part of that, we have the physical erosion, the physical transport of material, and also the chemical fluxes that are changing. And so what people will do is look at the enrichment of immobile, chemically immobile uh, materials like um, zirconium. Um, compared to the saprolite or even the bedrock and figure out how much chemical weathering has actually occurred over time. And so here's a global compilation of different soils where there's plotted the physical erosion rate versus the chemical erosion rate. And these scale. And we don't really know, this is still an active part of research, we still don't know how the whether the chemical is forcing the physical or the physical is forcing the chemical. But we can see that in these different systems that we actually have a, uh, these two empirical um, relationships. Oops. So I'll just end by saying that there's a couple frontiers. So one of them is looking at meteoric beryllium-10. It has a lot of attractive possibilities. And the, the second one is that um, no one has been able to really get paleoaltimetry to work for cosmogenic nuclides. Because production of cosmogenic nuclides has this altitude effect, um, uh, in theory, we should be able to use it to test things like um, dynamic topography. Specifically, when things are going from up to down would be easiest. Um, and it's, it would be an attractive candidate. Um, I was just talking to Greg about it. He says it's not possible. but. <laughs> Um, but maybe one of you smart, smart uh, kiddos <laughs> can get it to work. So um, thanks. We'll take any questions.